Imagine taking one mole of steam at, say, 200 degrees C, well above the boiling point of water, and cooling it in a way where we can control how much heat we transfer out of the water per unit of time. In this case, 20 joules per second. What do you think will happen to the temperature of the sample? It doesn't matter if you get the answer right, but it's useful to think about what will be going on before you see the correct answer. Well, if you remember your thermochemistry from last semester, you should have been able to conclude that the temperature will go down with a slope that depends on the heat capacity of the gas. How long will that happen? Until you reach the condensation temperature, which you should remember is the same as the boiling point, in this case, 100 degrees C. If we continue to remove heat at the same rate, what should happen at this point? Well, condensation will happen. Molecules of the gas will transition into a newly formed liquid phase. But what happens to the temperature while this process is going on? If you said that it would stay the same since the boiling point is a constant, given the external pressure, you'd be right. But how long does that take? Well, let's write the process that is happening like a chemical reaction. And, as you should have learned in the thermochemistry section last semester, every chemical reaction has an associated enthalpy change. In this case, it is the enthalpy of condensation. So cooling at 20 joules per second until we remove over 40 kilojoules takes a while. But then, once that's done, and all of the vapor that is going to condense has done so, what happens next? Well, we have liquid water at this point. And liquid water has a different heat capacity than does gaseous water, so it cools down, but with a different slope. How far does it cool down? I hope that zero degrees C is obvious to you, since that is the freezing point of liquid water. And if we continue to cool the sample from that point, what do you predict will happen? If you set another phase change, where the temperature stays the same, you would be right. But in this case, the enthalpy change, the enthalpy of fusion, is much smaller than the enthalpy of condensation so it doesn't take as long for our slow 20 joules per second removal rate to finish freezing our sample. One more step. Continuing cooling from here, what do you expect to see? Again, the sample, this time solid, will cool at yet a different slope, because once again, the heat capacity of solid ice is different from the heat capacity of both liquid water and water vapor. What we've constructed here is known as a cooling curve, and it is a fantastic experimental method to determine heat capacities, phase transition points, and enthalpies of phase transitions. Of course, you can run the experiment in reverse, if you prefer, adding energy rather than taking it away to create a heating curve, which will give you the same information. Notice that the slopes are the same but opposite in sign to those on the cooling curve, that the temperatures of the phase transitions are the same, and the enthalpies of phase transitions are the same but with the opposite sign. Now let's take a look at the same system from a slightly different perspective. Recall what we said a couple of videos back about boiling point. It is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the surrounding atmospheric pressure, allowing the bubbles that form upon boiling to be self-supporting. And we then concluded that if we change the atmospheric pressure, we correspondingly change the boiling point. That suggests that we can look at this vapor pressure diagram in a different way. If we view the y-axis as the atmospheric pressure rather than as the vapor pressure of the liquid, then the graph tells us what state or states the system is in. For example, let's suppose our sample is experiencing an atmospheric pressure of a standard one atmosphere and the temperature of the sample is 25 degrees C. Because the vapor pressure of the water is below the surrounding atmospheric pressure, the sample is not boiling, and so is primarily a liquid, other than the humidity caused by the vapor pressure. This is true for any point in this diagram that is above the vapor pressure line. On the other hand, let's imagine that our sample is experiencing a low pressure of only 20 kilopascals, but has been heated to 80 degrees C. Under these conditions, the atmospheric pressure is below the vapor pressure of water at this temperature, and so all of the sample will have vaporized. This region of the plot corresponds entirely to gaseous samples. The line itself, where the atmospheric pressure is the same as the vapor pressure of the liquid, corresponds to boiling or condensation, the conditions under which a phase transition can occur. What we have here are the beginnings of a phase diagram which summarizes the phase behavior of a substance. 
We're going to continue to explore phase diagrams, but we need to move away from water as our example substance to get started. This is because in at least one important detail, water is an exception rather than an exemplar. So for the moment, we will talk about carbon dioxide and we'll come back to water later. The main regions of carbon dioxide's phase diagram look like this. At low temperatures, we have a solid, the dry ice we discussed earlier. Remember that at one atmosphere pressure, dry ice transitions directly from solid to gas, sublimation. The one main region we have not mentioned has to be the liquid region, which means that we can identify two other transition lines, boiling and melting. And of course remember that each of these transition lines can go in both directions. Sublimation in reverse is deposition, melting in reverse is freezing, boiling in reverse is condensation. There are a few other features of this phase diagram to mention. The first is to ask yourself how many phases are in equilibrium at any given point on the diagram. In a main region, excluding the vapor pressure gas that is present above all solids and liquids, any main region has one phase. Each line corresponds to an equilibrium between two phases. The melting line is an equilibrium between solid and liquid, the boiling line is an equilibrium between liquid and gas, and the sublimation line is an equilibrium between a solid and gas. There is a point, however, where the lines meet. A single point where all three phases are in equilibrium with each other. This point is, perhaps not surprisingly, called the triple point. At the other end of the boiling point line, the line abruptly ends. To understand what is going on here, imagine a sample in the gas phase right about here. High temperature and already sort of a high pressure. Now increase the pressure even further. As we do so, the volume decreases. The molecules are pushed closer and closer together. At some point, despite the temperature being so high that the molecules have enough energy to escape their mutual attractions, they don't have enough available volume to escape each other. Eventually, the molecules, due to the excessive external pressure, are forced to be in such close proximity to each other that this gaseous state is indistinguishable from a liquid. Then, if you cool the sample, you get clearly into the liquid regime. But notice that you did this without ever actually passing through the phase transition of condensation. Let me repeat that. It, you have gone from gas to liquid without ever condensing. This means that there is some point above which the distinction between liquid and gas stops making sense. This point is called the critical point, and the fluid that exists above that critical point isn't really a liquid or a gas. It's called a supercritical fluid. The boundaries between gas or liquid and the supercritical fluid are not sharp ones. Supercritical fluids are fascinating phases that have a number of commercial uses, including decaffeinating coffee, extracting antioxidants from fruits and vegetables for use in cosmetics, and impregnating wood with fungicides. Finally, looking at this phase diagram, let's think about another of these transitions, the melting-freezing transition. Notice how this line is sloping ever so slightly to the right. This is because the solid form of carbon dioxide is more compact, more dense than the liquid form, which is normal because liquids have some degree of motion and restricting that motion forces the molecules to compact themselves. Imagine a liquid close to the melting point. Now, don't change the temperature, which means you don't modify the kinetic energy the molecules have at all, but increase the external pressure. That extra pressure forces the molecules into their solid arrangement, so the sample becomes a solid. And that is a standard phase diagram. However, notice that the sublimation line is really difficult to see because it is so close to the x-axis. Additionally, the behavior at very high pressures is off the chart to the top, as we will see for other examples later. Because of this, phase diagrams are often plotted on a semi-log scale, as shown here. It is the same information as the previous plot, but just shown in a different way. Now, I had mentioned that this phase diagram for carbon dioxide was typical, and that the one for water was atypical. Let's see why. Here is water's phase diagram. Do you notice what is different? Did you spot the difference? It is angled the other way. This is because of a very unusual property of water. Its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. This is why ice floats in water. Nearly every other substance, when it freezes, becomes more dense, and so the solid sinks. 
This means that for water, if we start with ice close to its melting point and compress it under very high pressures, it will melt. This phenomenon is often incorrectly given as the reason ice skaters can slide across the ice. If we zoom out further, we find that there are actually multiple different solid forms of ice, as is true of many substances. These different structures, only found under extreme conditions, correspond to different crystalline arrangements of the water molecules. We're not going to go into those other structures in detail for this class, but it's useful to remember that the main behavior we've been talking about is just part of the story.